Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary's live streaming this morning with Keeper Karen. Here we have Waffle, who is having a bit of breakfast this morning. Just see what she's having a munch. <laughs> All right, we might actually go and find Keeper Karen. Good morning, Keeper Karen. How are you going this morning? Good, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Karen, and I'm the head of koalas here at Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary. So, any questions that you've always wanted to know about koalas, just feel free to ask. All right. Well, we've got a few questions that I already have. So, first question Why do koalas sleep so much? Well, it is because their food is so low in energy, because they're reliant on eucalyptus leaves. They don't have a lot of nutrients in them, not a lot of sugars and starches to draw energy from. And they also don't store fat like other animals do. So therefore they have to spend a lot of time resting and sleeping to make sure that they can serve their energy for when they need it. So in total, koalas will spend between 18 and 20 hours a day resting or sleeping. All right. Do koalas have thumbs like we do? They do have thumbs, but not quite like we do. So koalas have uh, five digits on their hand. I um, can't really see Natty's hand very well, can... but uh, she's got three fingers you can see here and two thumbs over this side. And that is so that she can get a much stronger grip on the branches when she's climbing. Awesome. Thank you. Do koalas like cuddles? <laughs> it very much depends on the individual. Some of them love cuddles and they'll come looking for us and try and get some attention from us when we come into their space. But then there's others that are a little bit more standoffish and they prefer just to be left to themselves. So it's totally dependent on the koala as to how much uh, human contact that they prefer. What about this little koala here? Does she like cuddles? Little Nat. She's a little bit shy, actually. She's one of the ones that does like to keep to herself a little bit. Um, so this is her preferred um, way to spend the day, just like this. Just looking cute? Just being cute. Now, this question, I think a lot of viewers would probably want to know this one. Is koala's fur as soft as it looks? A lot of people will say no, but I actually think it is pretty soft, pretty lush. It's actually more woolly than furry and that's probably what people get surprised by when they first touch a koala. It's sort of like really thick, really plush lamb's wool because it is so dense. But again, it does vary a little bit between the individuals. So some of them will have really soft, silky, silky fur. Others, it'll be a little bit coarser. It sort of depends on the individual. It's like with our hair texture can be different for different individuals, same too with the koalas. And also in Queensland, of course, up here with the northern koalas, they've got this short, dense grey fur. Whereas if you went down into the southern states like Victoria, you would see the koalas have much longer, thicker fur and a sort of a chocolate brown colour. So it has a very different feel to what you will get with the northern koalas up here in Queensland. Do you have to do anything to keep their coats clean or do they do that themselves? Koalas look after themselves as far as keeping themselves beautiful. They have, oh, exhibit A, they have a grooming claw on their hind foot there that Nutty's using at the moment. It's actually two toes which have become fused together and there's two claws still coming out of the top and they use that as a comb. So it goes through their fur and it removes any debris, any old fur, anything like that. And that's how they keep themselves looking gorgeous. And when Natty stops scratching, You'll notice that she will actually um, have little tufts of fur stuck in her grooming claw there. And that is because of all of her good work with her grooming. So all that scratching you see them doing, they don't have fleas or anything like that. Most of it is actually just for grooming. Hmm. All right, I just had a question uh, from Cassio. What is their usual, uh, sorry, their favorite treat outside of their usual leaves? Pretty much nothing. <laughs> uh, their staple diet is eucalyptus leaves, but there are a number of species that they like to eat. So probably their favourite treat would be to get the species that they like the best and also the young juicy leaves, which we refer to as the tip. So that's all the really fresh young growth. And you'll notice that if any of the koalas, if you're watching them get fed, they'll go looking for the tip first. So that is definitely their favourite part. I have another question here from Jessica R. 
How long do baby koalas stay with mum like Poppy? So koalas will stay with their mum for 12 months before they're ready to actually venture off onto their own. Uh, but for that whole 12 months, we don't see them that whole time because, of course, koalas are marsupials. So they do most of their development inside their mother's pouch. So a lot of people think koalas are bears. They get called koala bears quite a lot, but they're actually not a bear. They're just simply koala. That's the correct name for them. The pouch is a little bit hard to see if they don't have a joey inside because it's not terribly big. Natty's is down there between her hind legs and she doesn't have a joey in there, so it's not very obvious. But um, for the first six months, that's where the joey spends its time. So we actually only see them from six months through to 12 months, and then they're ready to go off on their own. So with little Poppy, she's nearly 10 months old. She'll be 10 months old at the end of uh, this month. So in a couple of months, she'll actually be ready to go off away from mum. So we don't really see koala joeys um, for a whole lot of their time. It's really only the last four months of their life after they permanently exit the pouch that we get to see uh, koala joeys out and about. So where will Poppy go then after she is, you know, all grown up and ready to move away from mum? So when she's ready to become independent and she's weaned, she will actually go into another uh, group which will be of other young females who are all of a similar age to her and she'll get to grow up with them. Cool. Um, <laughs> I like this question quite a lot. Do koalas get hiccups? <laughs> koalas do get hiccups. Uh, sometimes it can be just random, but hiccups in koalas can also be a sign of stress. So if they get a fright or if something's upsetting them, you might see them suddenly start to do little hiccups. Um, but they do actually do hiccups just, um, it's just a normal part of their life. I've seen quite clearly joeys inside pouches, obviously, with the hiccups. Oh. The pouch is bouncing away there. The so, pouch is hiccuping. So they, they definitely do. Um, along, along the same kind of lines, um, I had another question that was asking about why do koalas flap their ears? Usually if a koala flicks their ears or flaps their ears, it's some kind of annoyance, so something's bothering them. It can be something like a mozzie or little bugs flying around or um, a little piece of leaf just lightly touching their ear and it's tickling their fur and so they flick it because it's annoying. But it can also be if they're annoyed with another koala. So if they're, another koala's coming over and it's trying to steal their seat, you might see them start to flick their ears and get a little bit annoyed. So yeah, usually that's why they do that. I had a question up on, on the live chat here. Um, why haven't koalas evolved to eat anything else? Wouldn't it be dangerous if all of the eucalyptus ran out? Definitely dangerous for eucalyptus to run out. And unfortunately, that's the biggest threat that they face in the wild at the moment is the destruction of their habitat. But when they evolved to eat eucalyptus leaves, that was actually a pretty sensible move because it's quite a toxic, uh, quite a toxic food source. There's very few animals that can tolerate it. Koalas became very specialised in it and it meant that they had a food source with very little to no competition. So when they first decided that that's the way they were going to go, it was actually a smart decision because they didn't have to outcompete other animals for their food. It's only now become a problem when um, habitat destruction became um, prevalent. So really, yeah, they won't evolve now obviously to eat anything else. They're very specialised towards eating eucalyptus leaf. But as I said, when they first started eating eucalyptus leaf, it was actually pretty smart. So the koalas here at Lone Pine, they've obviously got lots of leaf to be able to munch on. We have plantations where we grow our eucalyptus leaf for our koalas. So we've got one on site right here at the, at the sanctuary. Then we've got another in a couple of different locations in Brisbane, just to add to the variety, because obviously the different types of soil, uh, different areas will um, be better for different types of eucalyptus, different species, which means that we can add to the variety that we can actually provide for them. So these guys get provided with a much wider variety of eucalyptus than what their wild cousins would have. Right. Do they eat, do they get fresh leaf every day or is it every second day or? Fresh leaf every single day. So anyone who's been watching these guys over the, the webcams and all that kind of thing, you would have seen us feeding them quite regularly. They get it pretty much at the same time every day. They have a regular routine. So you'll notice that they'll start to, to wake up and become active in anticipation of that time arriving. And then once they, they hear the leaf and smell the leaf arriving, that's when 
the anticipation increases and then so does all of the activity. I have a question here from, I can't really read the name, can koalas swim? They can, koalas can swim. So if they find themselves in that situation or if they need to cross a water source to get across to the other side, they can swim. They're not the best swimmers. Um, I imagine this coat gets quite heavy when it's all wet, but they certainly can swim if they need to. Uh, question from Kenny here. Do younger koalas like Poppy sleep more or less than their older family and friends? I would probably say less and their mothers would probably agree because they do like to play a lot. They like to explore a lot, like to check everything out. So that when you watch the younger koalas, you'll see them awake and active a lot more than when you watch the adult koalas. Um, sorry, I've just missed a question here. Uh, from Flower Girl, how long do the koalas stay at Lone Pine? The koalas that you see here, they're all born here. So this is where they'll live or else they'll move out into other sanctuaries as part of breeding programs. But because they were born uh, with us around people, we're not allowed to release them out into the wild or anything like that because they probably wouldn't really know what they were supposed to do. And the other thing is, is that in the wild, as I said, habitat destruction is very prevalent. So introducing more koalas into dwindling habitat is probably not going to be the most beneficial for the wild koala population. So how old is little Nat here? Nat is now three years old, so she's fully grown. The females don't get to be as big as what the, the males are. Nat is about five kilos, which is pretty average for a koala up here in Queensland, a female koala. They can get between five and six kilos. The males though, they can get eight, eight and a half kilos. So obviously a lot bigger than what this young lady is here. So when people do see the females quite often, they think that that must be the young ones or babies or something like that. But there is a definite size difference between the boys and the girls. And then at what age do koalas start to breed? The female koalas can actually start breeding from 18 months old. So they do actually start uh, their Easter cycles quite young. The males are capable of reproducing quite young as well, but normally they're not going to be able to outcompete more mature males until they're older. So normally males don't reach their full maturity until they're about two or three, and they might not reach their full size until they're even as old as four. So um, yeah, males are a little bit slower um, than the females to actually get to that point. And has Nat uh, has she had any joeys? No, and that hasn't got any joeys just at the moment. She's only just started her um, her task towards becoming a mother, so she's just starting that journey. Uh, but yeah, so far she doesn't have a little baby with her yet. Um, just along the same lines, do the boys actually fight each other for the girls? The boys can be quite territorial, so they don't like other males coming into their space. They will, of course, accept females into their space, but they will actually compete with other males to maintain their territory. And by maintaining their territory, they're also uh, competing for the mating rights of all the females that are in that space as well. But then, of course, there's always those young rogue males that are moving for, through and trying to make their own territory for the first time they will sometimes mate with females that are within the dominant male's territory because obviously he can't be everywhere at once. But that is also a good way to ensure genetic diversity. It's a, it's a good way of actually getting new genes into a particular uh, colony of koalas. Is that when you start hearing the vocalisations, um, especially of the males? Breeding season is when you hear a lot more vocalisations from the koalas and they're really loud. So anyone who thinks that they're just these nice, quiet, little fluffy things, this is all they do, they're actually quite dynamic. And yeah, breeding season gets very, very noisy. The males have a very loud bellow, which is what it's called. A lot of people, when they hear it for the first time in the bush, think that there's wild pigs or something like that. So it doesn't sound like the kind of noise that should come from such a little cute animal. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Jeff, no spring and summer which is when they mate that's when you hear a lot more conversations amongst all the koalas is that um a good way then to try and find uh, koalas in the wild i've just got a question here from flower Girl asking how you would find koalas in the wild but obviously those vocalizations would help out a lot they would definitely help out a lot 
Uh, also, when you're moving through, if you're going on a bushwalk or something like that, looking for their droppings can also be a good sign. And also the, the telltale signs that a koala has been climbing trees because they leave very distinctive scratch marks on the trunks and things like that. Uh, so because during the day is usually when we're out and about and doing things, that's not so much an active time for koalas. Their most active time is kind of dawn and dusk. They're a crepuscular animal, so semi-nocturnal. But so we're looking more for signs of them rather than um, actual visual cues and all that kind of thing that you might see when they're actually in their wide awake time. Um, but certainly if you're happy, you're lucky enough to, to live in an area with koalas, you will definitely hear them having conversations during the night and it'll give you an idea of where they are. It's not always easy to find them even with the bellows because it's designed to travel a long way because that's their way of communicating without conserving any energy. They can bellow and all the koalas in the area can hear it without the male actually having to move. Just got a question here from Ola. Is there a breeding program among zoos for koalas? I know koalas are not only in Australia, Australian zoos, which will link with the next question of when is breeding season as well? There is a breeding program with koalas. So obviously the koalas that are in overseas zoos originated from Australia because this is the only place you can find koalas. And within Australia, of course, as I said, some of these guys might move into to other places to um, enrich their uh, bloodlines and their genetic diversity and vice versa. We'll get other koalas come in from other zoos and sanctuaries to enrich our genetic diversity as well. And spring and summer is the time that koalas will be breeding. Um, so we're coming towards the, the very end of breeding season now and then we'll start to see joeys emerging from the pouch in another few months. So those koalas that are in the wild, um, do, what are their predators in Australia? Koalas don't have a lot of natural predators because living in, its, in the trees, there's not a lot of things that can actually come and get them. When they come down onto the ground to move to a new tree, that's when they're most vulnerable. So that's when they encounter things like dogs, um, the, they can encounter in the trees things like large raptors, like birds of prey. They can also have carpet pythons, like large pythons can take koalas, absolutely. And even large lizards like goannas, because they can actually climb trees and things as well. It's usually the younger koalas that are most at risk, or the really old or sick ones, because an adult koala is actually quite good at defending themselves. They're also quite quick, uh, but obviously, dogs are their biggest threat and more so than wild dogs, domestic dogs are actually a huge threat for koalas. It's funny that you say that they're quick, they don't really seem like the fastest animal. <laughs> they, they don't look very fast but when you see them running along the ground they can actually get quite a bit of speed up but they are definitely sprinters not marathon runners because as I said they don't have a lot of energy reserves so they can do a quick dash and then shoot up the nearest tree but if the trees are few and far between they can run out of energy and then obviously predators can catch up to them. I've got a question here um, what is it that people can do um, to help these guys? The biggest thing is to help preserve habitat. So uh, anything that you can do along those lines is helpful. So even using recycled paper products is a big thing because obviously we're not destroying habitat to make toilet paper and um, hand towels and all those types of things. Uh, but if you also live in an area where there are koalas, you can plant koala friendly trees just to see if any koalas will enjoy those in the future. Little things that people can do every day is as you're driving along, just keep a very close eye out for koalas. You'll see some warning signs in a lot of areas where they know koalas live and they'll let you know that there could be koalas crossing the roads at times. So be really careful at those times because as I said, dawn and dusk is their most active time. It's also really difficult to see them when you're driving at that time. So definitely sticking to the speed limits um, or maybe even slowing down a bit when you're in a known koala area just so that you have time to stop or move out of their way. And even, you know, leave, keep your dog inside at night so that if there's a koala in your area and it moves through your backyard, it's not going to interact with the dog. And pools, believe it or not, swimming pools. I did say they can swim. The swimming pools are usually designed with very slippery sides so a koala can't climb out once they've gone in. And that's what usually results in them drowning is just because they, they just can't get out of the pool. So if you anchor a rope to the outside of the pool, put a float on the end and let it dangle in the water, 
it gives something for the koala to hold on to and climb out. And not just koalas, but other wildlife that might fall into swimming pools as well. So there are a lot of little things that people can do. And if everybody's doing those little things, it can make a big difference. All right, thanks, Karen. We are probably going to wrap it up, but I've got two last questions <laughs> for you. The hardest questions of all. The first one is, when or how did you fall in love with <laughs> koalas? Uh, after I finished university and I came to work at Lone Pine, uh, I didn't, to be honest, didn't have koalas forefront in my mind. Weird, but coming to Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary. But when I met them, it was just love at first sight. And even though I've worked with a lot of different native species over the years, I always come back to these guys. There's something special about them that just tugs at the heartstrings. But also they're extremely challenging. There are a lot more, there's a lot more to them than what people would think. And they continue to teach me things all the time. So they're always challenging and they're, they're always teaching me. All right, and this is the hardest question. <laughs> Who is your favorite koala <laughs> here at Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary? Uh, I don't have a favorite. I no, a favorite. you need. <laughs> <laughs> I have a few, um, but yeah, definitely right up there is Yeti, who is a male who's now getting to be about 12 years old. He does have a very special place in my heart. All of them do, but you just notice every now and again that a few of them take up a bigger space and definitely Yeti is one of those. All right, thanks so much everyone for those questions. Thanks Keeper Karen and thanks Nat for showing off her cleaning <laughs> and grooming skills. Tune in next time guys. <laughs> See ya.